Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is very frustrating from the jump. It involves the murder of a young woman that simply was not investigated, like at all. It's not known why, whether this was a case of a botched investigation or if they just chose not to investigate at all or if this is some sort of cover-up. I'm curious to see what you all are going to think about this case and why it was bungled so freaking badly. But before we get into it, I just wanted to give a huge shout out to my patrons, Emily, Chelsea, Michael, and Courtney. Your support truly means so much to me. It's because of support from you and the rest of the Patreon family that makes it possible for me to continue doing what I love and sharing these very important cases with everybody. So again, from the very bottom of my heart, Thank you so, so much for your support. With that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we're going to discuss the disturbing death of Ellie Warren. Ellie Warren was born and raised in the suburb of Melbourne, Australia, called Mordialic, with her parents, Paul and Nicole, who were divorced at the time. She was described as being a confident, strong-willed, and kind-hearted young woman. She went on to attend Parkdale Secondary College, and after that, she had planned on attending James Cook University in Queensland to study marine biology. Marine biology was her biggest passion in life, and she was so excited to spend her life in this career. She was accepted into college, and she was excited to start her education and work towards her passions. However, before settling down and getting into her studies, Ellie wanted to explore. She was 20 years old with an appetite for adventure. She loved going new places, meeting new people, and she made the most out of every single day. She had a huge passion for helping the environment and advocating for the ocean, as well as for helping the less fortunate. So, she decided to explore a new country while also doing what she could to help the local environment for six weeks before starting school. Ultimately, in October of 2016, she chose to head to the East African country of Mozambique to pursue a six-week volunteering trip with an African conservation and research company called Africa Underwater. While there, she would be volunteering and studying with marine biologists working at the coral reefs just off of the coast. This was her dream. She set off on her flight going thousands of miles halfway across the world from Australia to Africa where she had the absolute time of her life. She saw the beautiful marine life, and according to her mother, when she saw her first whale shark, she was just ecstatic. She loved sharks, she threw on her wetsuit and jumped in the cage to swim with the sharks, no matter the conditions or visibility, it was just exhilarating for her, she loved it. She gushed to her friends just how beautiful the country was, and she was passionate about getting to know the African culture. She was thoroughly enjoying her time there. At the time, she was staying at a bungalow in the area of Casa Berry along Tofo Beach. She spent those six weeks volunteering with the company and learning so much while doing so. Then, after those six weeks were over, she planned on staying in Mozambique for a few extra days to just spend diving, swimming, and relaxing. She stayed in other popular areas of Tofo Beach, which is known to be a magnet for divers, surfers, and backpackers. This area was known for its beautiful beaches, lively nightlife, beach bars, and good restaurants. By Tuesday, November 8, 2016, Ellie was said to have checked into the Waiani Periango Backpackers Hostel at 6.30 p.m., where she dropped off most of her belongings on her bed before heading back out. That night, Ellie had went out with a group of friends that she had met during her time volunteering. The group went out to Victor's Bar for some drinks before going to one of the friends' houses to make some cocktails there. They stayed at the house for about an hour or two before their cocktail-making ingredients ran out, Friends say that Ellie got bored at the house, so she then went by herself back out to Victor's bar. At that point, friends say that Ellie was not drunk. She was completely coherent and able to take care of herself. She wasn't making a bad or irresponsible decision by going back out. They said that they all felt safe in that area because the locals went out of their way to look out for tourists visiting their small town. A bit later, the friends met Ellie back at the bar. 
At first, the friends couldn't find her because the bar was very crowded, so they sat in the front of the bar and drank some beers together. Then, Ellie walked back up and around the corner of the bar to meet up with the friends. She was sort of like across from the bar, so she didn't necessarily go right up to them, but she gestured to the group, saying that she was going to get a beer from the bar and then come back and join them. This was at 11 p.m. on November 8th. But after making that gesture to the friends and heading back up to the bar, she didn't return. At that point, the friends didn't think much of it. They assumed that she probably had just gotten sidetracked with others, that she was hanging out with other locals in the area and whoever else was at the bar. You know, she was very good at making friends. She was very social. She could walk up to anybody and have a conversation. So they just assumed that she got sidetracked. So, by midnight, the friends left Victor's bar and they went back to their respective places. When they left, at that point, they had assumed that Ellie had also went to her hostel and had gone to sleep. However, early that next morning on November 9th, 2016, some local fishermen made a disturbing discovery. They found the lifeless body of a young girl who was lying face down on the ground behind a toilet block located just 20 meters from the bar that Ellie was known to be at that previous night. Of course, the local fisherman called the police to report that the body had been found, and of course, the body was quickly identified as belonging to Ellie by her friends. When her body was found, her underwear was around her knees, her black t-shirt was torn apart. Now, remember this fact for a bit later because it will come back into play. It's a pretty big piece of this case. Of course, after her body was found, police called her parents to let them know what happened. Obviously, this was a truly heartbreaking phone call that no parent wants to get. However, from this point on, Ellie's family believes that the police either weren't interested in investigating her death or they flat out covered things up to make it look like a completely different situation than what it really was. Now, even though she was Australian, obviously this death was up to Mozambique police to investigate. At first, Australian authorities assured Ellie's family that the Mozambique police were going to do their best to find out what happened to their daughter. And for a few months, they held onto the hope that they were investigating to the best of their abilities. However, as time passed without any communication and them finding out a lot of very concerning information, Paul and Nicole started to believe that the police just were not doing their jobs. Now, after discovering her body, Ellie was sent off to a Mozambique medical examiner for an autopsy. According to Ellie's father from the jump, the police gave them inaccurate information that was based off of God knows what. The initial police report stated that Ellie died of a drug overdose. It seemed that the original medical examiner who did her autopsy just bungled it. They didn't seem competent at all, and they didn't check for what seems literally anything. It literally seems like they didn't do anything with her autopsy. So her body was sent to South Africa about a week later, who conducted another examination. When her blood was tested in the toxicology report, it was found that there were no drugs in her system. Now, we do know by her friend's accounts that she had been drinking that night. I don't know what the alcohol level was or if they had found any alcohol in her system, but if they didn't find any alcohol either, that would be concerning in terms of accuracy of the autopsy because we do know that she was drinking. But either way, after this was found, police changed her cause of death. According to the second autopsy, it was found that Ellie had sand in her airways and her lungs, which was obviously obstructing her breathing. The examiner believed that she had breathed in that sand while she was still alive, so it's not like someone had shoved sand down her throat. It was breathed in, probably while she was being attacked. It was also found that she suffered from mechanical asphyxiation. It was found that she had bruising and abrasions to other areas of her body as well, though I wasn't able to find exactly where they were or what they think caused them. So her cause of death was determined to be the result of suffocation as a result of homicide. 
And to note, they did say that they found no sign of sexual assault. However, this second medical examiner said that her examination was made a lot more difficult since this was the second examination that was done. She said that her body had been embalmed, so she couldn't get the most accurate reading on her blood work, so she couldn't determine how intoxicated she was, they couldn't say whether someone spiked her drink and caused her to pass out. She also said that there were compression marks on her neck, but that doesn't necessarily mean that she was strangled in that way. She said that it's possible that those marks were made by the first person who conducted her autopsy. In addition to that, she found no evidence that her body had been moved from the location where she was found. She said that there weren't enough abrasions on her body to show that she had been dragged. However, Ellie's father disagrees. Now, like I said, Ellie's father believed from the jump that police had botched this investigation. Already, we can see that they made quick assumptions about her cause of death, which were quickly contradicted by what the medical examiner found. Now, they did change the cause of death on the police report, but even after doing so, it seemed that police still took no further action to investigate, even though they had just labeled her death as a homicide. They didn't question suspects, they didn't investigate the scene, and they didn't contact Ellie's family to keep them updated on what was going on whatsoever. They didn't reach out for additional help if they weren't able to investigate the case properly. They did absolutely nothing. As we go through this case, I will explain more areas in which the police seem to have failed in their investigation. But either way, Paul, Ellie's father, made his own trips out to Africa to do an investigation of his own because he knew that police were not going to do their due diligence in this case. His first trip to Mozambique was in November of 2018 and again in 2019. The reason that him traveling there was a little bit later was because, again, he was assured at the beginning of the investigation that it was ongoing and that they were going to do what they could to solve it. But once he realized that they literally weren't doing anything, that is when he had to take the steps to investigate on his own. So like I said, Ellie was found to have sand in her airways, but the police said that it doesn't appear that she had been moved from where she was found. They believe that she had died in the same area by that toilet. But Paul went to the area where Ellie's body was found and he said that the dirt there was hard and compacted. And remember, there was loose sand found in her airways, which the ME said she probably breathed in. And the sand in her airways were a completely different color than the dirt in the area where she was found. So, Paul thinks that her body was taken to that location after the fact, because otherwise, there isn't much explanation for how that sand could have gotten into her airways. He thinks that after leaving the bar, she was walking along the beach by herself when someone attacked her. He believes that her head was forcibly pushed into the sand while she was being attacked, possibly sexually assaulted, and that she eventually suffocated. Then he believes that her body was dragged to where it was later found. He points to the fact that her t-shirt was torn and tattered when she was found. Now, when police originally found her body, they mentioned nothing about the torn and tattered t-shirt. It wasn't until Paul did his own investigation that he spoke with two locals that had a photo of Ellie's body when she was found. The photo was taken by the local fisherman, the man who found her body, and I guess the locals circulated this photo for whatever reason. But with that photo, that is when Paul found out about the torn and tattered shirt. Police were completely ignoring the fact, and it seemed that Australian police ignored that fact as well. Again, the Emmy said that there weren't enough abrasions on her body to show that she was dragged, but there is never really an explanation for how the t-shirt got all torn up. There's no explanation for why the police refused to acknowledge the t-shirt as well. I saw in some sources that the police didn't have the photo, so they claimed not to know about it. But Paul uncovered this photo within a few hours of being around locals in the area two years later. So that just goes to show that police simply did not put in any effort to talk to the people in the area or try to gather information from the locals. 
Or it can say that they had the picture, they knew about it, but they covered it up and now they're pretending to not know. And as you may have expected, the t-shirt has since gone missing, it wasn't collected for evidence, so there's no way to pull anything from it. Yet another thing that police have either failed on or chosen to cover up. Then, to add to that suspicion, and I think this is probably one of the most disturbing aspects of this case, Paul went ahead and spoke with some of the friends of Ali's who were present when her body was found. So, like I said, her body was found by the local fisherman. He was the one who took the photo, and it showed Ellie lying face down in the sand, sprawled out with her arms and legs open, with her clothes all torn and tattered. However, when Paul spoke with two friends of Ellie's, they said that they saw her body about an hour after police arrived, and at that time, she was in a completely different position. When they got to the scene, it looked like she was facing with her bottom up and facing towards the toilet and then leaning forward in the Muslim prayer position or similar to like a puppy dog pose in yoga. So, the way she was positioned when she was seen by her friends is completely different to how the fisherman found her and the picture that shows how she was found. To Paul, this says that the police who first arrived staged her body to make it look like she was using the toilet when she fell forward face first into the sand. He thinks that they wanted to claim that she was overdosing, had fallen off the toilet when she was using it, fell face down into the sand, and was breathing in the sand to the point where she suffocated that way. That is what Paul believes police are trying to say. So the fact that her body was repositioned is extremely disturbing and very concerning. Now, when Paul was conducting his own investigation, he was met with people who warned him about a local kingpin in the area who people were afraid of. He also received a message from another woman who visited the area on vacation who also warned him about a scary man in the area. Apparently, this woman's children met a man named Tony at a local market and then told their mother about him. So I guess the children were at a local market, the mother was back at their hostel, hotel, whatever thing that they were staying in, but the mother asked a local who worked at the place that she was staying at and this worker said that Tony was very dangerous and warned them to stay away from him. Apparently, this worker said that she knew about the Australian girl that had died there, and she is confident that Tony and his gang are behind it. She almost said it as if it was like common knowledge to the locals around the area that Tony was the one responsible for the death of this Australian girl. It appears that Tony is a big drug dealer in the area who is very dangerous and is known for making people disappear. This woman said that this is the reason that authorities aren't acting on Ellie's case, because that man is dangerous. Paul set out to try and hire a local to speak with Tony and get recordings of him to see if he would admit to killing Ellie. And I don't think he straight up confessed to anything, but he did say on these recordings that he's involved in criminal activity. Paul hoped that this would open up an investigation, but as of right now, it doesn't seem like this has led to anything significant. Obviously, him talking about criminal activity isn't enough to connect him to Ellie's murder, so they really aren't seeing that as something that could connect him to it, so they're not investigating it as such. So, some people think that corruption is to blame for the police not investigating. Others say that they just want to cover this up because they want to protect tourism in their country so that people aren't afraid that they'll be killed if they visit. This is a small town that heavily relies on tourism, so they think that this could be the reason. Or again, it could be that the police are working with or afraid of this big drug dealer. Then others think that it's pure incompetence. Some people from the area who know how the police work basically said that they are severely underfunded. They are not well-trained for this type of investigation and they simply don't have the resources to investigate and that's the reason why things haven't been done to solve this case. But to sort of go back on that, they do have the Australian police in their back pocket. They can use them to help them investigate the case and it seems like they're not using any other resources or help to investigate the case. So I personally don't think it's just true incompetence because 
they have resources. They have people that they could get to come in and help from the outside, but it does not seem like they are doing that. The biggest belief within this case, though, is that the police just don't want to acknowledge it and that they're hoping that it will just go away. People in the area said that crime happens there all the time and that it just goes unreported. They think that police in the area believe if they just ignore the murder for long enough that people will forget about it and the problem will go away. As of right now, people believe that Ellie's murder could have been the result of a few different things. Like I said, there was no sign of sexual assault, so it doesn't seem like that's the motive. Although again, the autopsies were not very good. We don't know how accurate they are. So again, it is possible that she was sexually assaulted and that there just wasn't evidence of it because the medical examiners were not very competent when they were completing the autopsies. So that is, in my opinion, still a possible motive. Some people think that maybe she saw something that she shouldn't have that night, such as drug dealings or another murder or something else that was going on with this whole like drug dealer situation and that someone killed her because of that. Now, some reports that I saw have said that Ellie was seen having some sort of disagreement with a local man at the bar on the night that she went missing. Because of the lack of the investigation though, we don't really know any other details about that. But in my opinion, it is possible that this had something to do with it. Maybe this was this Tony character, though I do think if it was him, people would say something, but maybe it was someone who worked with Tony. Maybe she did say or see something that she shouldn't have and they retaliated by killing her. I'm not sure. Police probably aren't sure because they did investigate. So I just wanted to mention it because it's out there, but we don't really know much more other than that. Others think that it could have been a case of a robbery gone wrong. Again, this is an area that's known to have a lot of crime. So it's possible that somebody attempted to rob her. She fought back so she was killed. I think that with her underwear being pulled down and her t-shirt being tattered, I do think that this could mean that she was dragged. A lot of people might think that this is an obvious sign of sexual assault, but I also think that it could just be from her being dragged. I do believe that her pants were missing. I haven't seen anything about her pants in any of the reportings that I've seen. And the only picture that I saw of her body when it was found was blurred out. But from what I was able to make out from that picture, it does look like her pants were missing when she was found. But again, if you think about it, when the body is being dragged, the clothes aren't going to stay in the same place. I think it's possible that if she was dragged and her pants fell down and slid off, that her underwear also slid down, but just there wasn't enough dragging space for them to fall off completely. I think that this is possible and it could have been so easy to prove or disprove if police just conducted a simple investigation. But again, no investigation was done, so there's no way that we could possibly know. If they looked for her pants to see if it was in another location, Maybe they could see, oh, she clearly was dragged. Or if it was in a completely different location where it shouldn't be, they could say, oh, this scene was staged or someone took her pants from her. Or it could show that there was a sexual assault and this person took her pants and hid them somewhere if the pants were completely missing. I think the pants could be a big part of this. I guess others could argue that she went out to use the bathroom in this public toilet without her pants, but then you have to wonder, were her pants found in her hostel? Did she... Put the pants in the hostel, lay down, and then realize she had to use the bathroom, so she went out to use it without putting any pants on. I guess that's possible, but I do think that finding her pants could be a big part in this case. And again, that's if she was wearing pants, she could have been wearing like a bathing suit. That's what the bottoms could have been, but they were described as underwear, so I do just want to put that out there that I don't think she was wearing pants and I don't think they ever found where they were or what happened to them and I also have not seen it mentioned anywhere, anything about the pants. Now, people in the area originally were all under the impression that Ellie had died from a drug overdose. That is what they were told by the police, so they believed it. But when Paul went out there to investigate on his own, that is when people learned that this was actually a murder. Ellie's friends and people close to her and basically anybody who saw that picture that the fisherman took that showed how tattered her shirt was, they all believe wholeheartedly 
that Ellie was murdered. Paul is very disappointed at the lack of action from the Australian police. They have been informed on the investigation and they haven't really shared much of anything from Paul. He thinks that they're just as incompetent as the Mozambique police were in investigating, but he doesn't know why. They apparently opened an inquest into the investigation of her death in 2021, but I haven't seen anything about it. It doesn't seem like anything came from it, and it seems like just another disappointing turn in this case. He said that their investigation is just in shambles. Their first official report, though, indicated Ellie had died of a drug overdose, even though forensic analysis found no evidence of drugs in her system. And her father, Paul Warren, thinks they've botched the entire investigation. He spent the past four years and at least $50,000 travelling to and from Mo Mozambique and fighting to uncover the truth about Ellie's death, even recruiting a sex worker to infiltrate a crime gang in the village where she was killed. He now believes he's found the gang leader responsible for murdering Ellie and is calling on homicide detectives in Mozambique to follow up his covert findings. He joins me now. Paul, thank you very much for your time. Now, it's very interesting because DFAT and the AFP had the clear version of Ali's crime scene photo taken by the fisherman two weeks after her murder. They knew Ali was murdered and they knew and could see on the, new, on the clear crime scene photo that her top was completely ripped open, right? Yeah. Now so you have the Mozambique police turn up on the scene, right? And they say there's no signs of a struggle, no signs on the body, no signs around the body, and their examining team does the same thing. So they should have invited right? themselves. They could have applied to be invited, could they? And be part of the investigation? Yes, there was no application put in whatsoever. I found out from the, the, the embassy in... Uh, it's, it's in... Um, in Japan, I think. Okay, tell me about your covert yeah. operation to infiltrate this gang. Well, um, I got a tip off back in March about uh, a suspect who's a red hot suspect. Uh, this was from a South African lady who's, uh, whose kids were in the marketplace and they came back and their caretaker told her that he's a very dangerous suspect and they shouldn't be associating with him. And she said, why? And he said, remember the Australian girl? She was um, uh, the suspect uh, and his gang were involved in that, right? So that started the ball rolling for me. Uh, also, COVID hit, I had to wait. And then I got in contact with a German investigator who lives, who had a house in, in Africa and a wife. And he knew the culture and the routine and he was a big asset to me. And he helped me in a major way start off a COVID operation so that we could get some information from this major suspect that I've got. Now, he's a red hot suspect. He fits the criteria. Um, so he needs to be looked at. Um, so, so when you say he needs to be looked important. at, are you looking at Australian <laughs> investigators to do that? Or do you want those in Mozambique to make the first move? Well, the... The Mo Seriously, the Mozambique police are not capable. The AFP know they haven't got the resources or the capability to take on a murder investigation. They haven't got it. I've got all the emails. I've got the evidence. I've done 70 pages for the coroner. Now, just so the gravity of your viewers can see exactly how ripped Ali's top is, I'm going to show them now. Now, this... this this is how ripped the top was, right? The AFP and DFAT knew that two weeks after it happened, right? They did not tell the doctor, Dr Lynch. They did not tell the coroner, right? I had a meeting with the doctor 10 months after it happened and the three AFP agents turned up to that meeting and there was no mention about Ellie's ripped top and the clear photo. Paul, what happened... That's from our own AFP. What happened to Ellie? What do you know happened to her? Ali, Ali, um, uh, the doctor, the second autopsy, Dr Lynch, no, no, not Dr, Dr. Clip, sorry, uh, said that uh, Ali died of asp aspiration, breathe, breathing in sand into her lower airways. Now, I can't trust the, the doctors here. I, I, there's, I've, I've, I've got the facts. 
So I've got my own doctor, Dr. Collins, who's doing a report to the, to the coroner and he's going to accept that report, right? Yep. I can't trust the AFP. I can't trust DFAT, as I've said, right? And this top, this rip top of Ali's, now, if it's ripped this bad, like she was on the ground, right, like that, and that's how you view it from her back. Yep. The shoulder's gone, yep. a little bit here and a little bit here, yep. and then you've got the complete top on the other side. Now, you can't tell me that the AFP don't scrutinise this, yep. this one crime scene photo we had because the Mozambique police have got rid of all their crime scene photos. Jeez. They've got rid of all the evidence. It doesn't exist anymore. All right, now, Paul, why? Charlie Benzina said to me, where's, where's this top? Paul, I've got to, I've got to jump in DNA there. There DNA on this top. I've got to jump in there because I've got a satellite just about to cut off. But thank yep. you. I appreciate that. We've got to keep in touch. And all yep. the very best at the coroner's hearing coming up next yep. month. So it doesn't seem like the Australian police or Australian government are helping... Mozambique police aren't doing anything. I think Paul and his family have hired a PI to help them with everything that they're doing. He spent upwards of $50,000 to investigate her death. But as far as we know, there isn't anything that can be done right now because the police are not doing anything. It's not like Paul can just find the suspect and go and arrest him. As of right now, I've seen a couple articles that have said that they do have suspects and that they are investigating. So maybe there's enough pressure on them to actually do something, but at the same time, they could just be saying that, trying to stave us off until we forget about it and they can just continue not doing anything. We truly don't know. As of right now, that is where the case sits. There is a Facebook group that you can visit to keep updated on the case as well as to show your support. So if you do want to support Ellie's family and keep up to date on what is happening in the case, please check out the page that I have linked down below. But that is all I have for today's video. It's so frustrating and angering that this young woman just had to die and nothing was done about it. Justice was not sought by the people responsible for getting justice for her. I admire her father so much for taking the case into his own hands and investigating the death of his own daughter. That is something that no father should have to go through, yet he did it. And much of the information that we know about this case comes directly from him. So all I can do right now is share the information that we do have and hope that continuing to bring Ellie's case to light and speaking about it can help show everybody involved that we care about Ellie. We want whoever killed her to be brought to justice. We demand that something be done in her case. And hopefully, with enough voices and enough causing waves, maybe some movement will happen in this case. Maybe there is movement happening in this case, I don't know, but I do think that if we are loud enough and we cause enough waves, that maybe something can be done in this case because we do truly care about Ellie. There are so many people out there who want her case solved and... I don't think it's going to take a lot to solve it, at least if they investigated from the jump. I don't think it would have taken a lot. At this point, it's going to be a lot harder, but I still think it can be done. I really hope that we get more information in the coming months. It does, again, seem like some things are happening behind the scenes, so I'm a little bit hopeful, but cautiously so. Ellie had so much to live for. She was going to do so many amazing things in her life. She was so young, so full of life and she just wanted to explore before settling down into her career, and it's just so, so very tragic what happened to her. So thank you all so much for listening to Ellie's story. Please spread this case as far and wide as you can, whether it's by sharing this video or sharing any of the resources that I have listed down below. There is a 60 Minutes episode that was done on this case. I will have that listed down below. Please just share anything you can about Ellie if you can get people's eyes on this case, get people knowing that we care about her and her case and that we want her death to be solved. But now that is where I'm going to end today's video and I want to know what you all think. Do you think this is a cover-up? Do you think that the police are just incompetent? What do you think happened to Ellie? Do you think that she was murdered? If so, why? Or do you think that the Mozambique police are right and that this was an overdose? 
let's discuss in the comments down below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. All are listed down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.